Hi everyone, Jeremy, the DC fan here, and I'm just talking to you a little early before this episode because this week's pull list, Lock and Key, written by Joe Hill, has some themes in it that are difficult for some people to handle. So I wanted to give a little trigger warning here before the pull list and the podcast got started so that you would be fully informed before going into this episode. So if you need to skip this week's pull list, we understand, and we absolutely respect your right to do so. I'll leave the timestamps in the description of this week's episode, but just understand that there are some trigger warnings here for sexual assault, uh, physical assault, and child endangerment. So if these things are upsetting to you, please skip the pull list this week. If not, please enjoy this week's episode and have a fantastic rest of your day. Welcome to Talking Trades, a weekly podcast where we talk about comics so you don't have to. I'm Jeremy, I'm a DC fan. And I'm John, I'm a Marvel nut. And we're here, and we are talking about lots of stuff this week. Not a ton of news, but some news. But we're also going to talk about Lock and Key for the last episode of... Spookvember! Spookvember! Uh, and Matt's still taking his, uh, his, his break from the podcast, so I can't have him edit in a bunch of, like, fun, like, organs and bats and... You know, uh, lightning sounds. So, and I don't, I don't have time to do that myself. Theater of the mind, everybody. Theater of the mind. Imagine it. Uh, but before you imagine it, let's jump right into this week in geek. This week in geek. This week in geek, John. That uh, that Green Lantern show. It's gonna happen. I'm excited. Now, for it to happen. We've got some. We, good. You should be. Now we've got some information about the Green Lantern show. Uh, first and foremost, the villains appear to be... This is just speculation, it looks like, but the the Dominators. And, John, I've never seen the Dominators before. Have you? I have not. Apparently they're from the Arrowverse and the a comic event called Invasion, with an exclamation point, that I have not read. Okay. Very cool. That It's cool. I, I don't know them, but I'm excited to watch it. The other information we're getting about the Green Lantern show is that it's going to be TVMA. That is more exciting. That means they can say swears, they can do murders, and they can like have the show be the show we want it to be. I'm very excited about that. I am too. I am too. Like, you are as well also? That also, yes, as well also. What I like about that is it also distances them from like Marvel. As like DC's okay, like... Yeah. The bad boy of comics, like not exact, not exactly, <laughs> obviously, but like they need a different yeah. image from Marvel, and this definitely affords them the creative freedom to do storylines that Marvel cannot do. First, they have F Batman, which this isn't your mom, grandma's. Teenagers. That's a no no word. That's a no no word. <laughs> and now we have this. So this is awesome. This also doesn't mean that it's guaranteed to be TVMA, but I I hope that this speculation is true because I would like that. Uh, it's going to be. A, I would like it to be kind of a gritty, you know. Don't I don't need you to ham it up and be cartoony about it. I want th- their space cops. Do space cop stuff. I'm into it. I'm into it as well. Speaking with more DC television, uh, Wonder Girl uh, is a TV show coming out with a uh, Latine hero or heroine. I'm sorry, heroes are men. Uh, the character is Yara Flor, and she is the daughter of an Amazonian warrior and a Brazilian river god. Newly created character will be Wonder Woman of DC's upcoming Future State event. Let's so go. This is going to be this is the Future State event uh, coming up, but she's going to get a TV show report. Oh, and that's the, the hero who gets the show. Yes, interesting. Isn't that cool? We could have a we could have a new Spider Gwen in our hands. Ooh, the uh, art for this uh, hero is amazing. I love the. Use of like two different color blues and the gold stars and the Wonder Woman logo. I'm into this. John, how do you feel? Ooh, about this? that looks good. A tattoo on her leg. That's also cool. And like the red eye across Very her cool. eyes. That's also cool. This is awesome. It might have some cultural significance, the tattoo and the eye paint, but I, I don't know what that is, no, but I'm very excited does. to learn. I just am ignorant and don't know what that is. Yeah, we're both <laughs> excited to learn about it. I'm excited so for it. So this... This is interesting. Um, they they refer to as a Latinx hero. Yes, our heroine. Have you seen the the? the it's not a debate, but there's a, a movement to change from Latinx to Latine. Have you seen that? I've not seen that. So I I, I had 
being a straight white man who lives in Illinois, I hadn't heard much about this. I had seen Latinx before, and the reason that they the the reason thing that I had heard that this is done is because Latina or Latino is a Gendered. female or a male. Yeah. Yes, yes. Latinx is how you refer to it as non-binary. It's gender neutral. And um, there is a push from the um, Spanish-speaking community to be more inclusive in that way. And so from what I had seen, Latinx came from scholarly areas, uh, papers, journals, things like that. But it's not doesn't really work in the actual language. So among people who actually speak the language, they're using e as the ending instead of a or a and e is not is gender neutral it's not male or female and so it's latine uh as opposed to latina or latino and i was like oh that's interesting so trying to be more progressive and more up to date i just wanted to throw that out there that this the headline says wonder girl tv series being developed featuring latinx heroine it would actually be latine heroine again Maybe this is not the correct, but this is what I've read, and I read a couple articles, making sure that I'm not just talking out of my no, butt. No, I like it. But it seems like that is the way people want to do. The challenge I see with that specifically is currently we're dealing with a pandemic. Everyone's online reading stuff. I think the first exposure then would be read or written, and I think it'd be difficult to have that not be Latin for people sure. who are I don't think there's like a the, push like don't say Latinx. I don't think people are saying don't do Latinx. No, I I'm, think it's I'm just for it. Hey, I just think that the initial that, like, the initial thing is going to be like either this is a new thing or just reading it and assuming it's L A T I N E Latin. And I get that. Sure, but That's I'm true all too. for it. Whatever, whatever's I, more inclusive. I have no authority whatever makes people feel like they. I am super for whatever benefits the most people. Especially if you are someone in the, if you are someone in the um, Hispanic uh, Spanish speaking community, please reach out to us and let us know what you think uh, as a person who actually speaks the language uh, works and what we can do to be more inclusive. Because we always want to do that. But I just wanted to bring that up. It doesn't matter if necessarily for the story, but I just thought that was something interesting mm-hmm. to bring up. But all uh, signs point to this being awesome. I'm super into this character and super into this character design, and I cannot wait to see it. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, you know, we, bit... we like the, the new Green Lantern, and I know that Future Chase yes. is going to bring a bunch of new heroes, but I'm definitely all for it. Absolutely. Any, any day of the week that you can bring in more people into the comics world and make people enjoy reading comics that look like them, I'm super into it. As long as it's not uh, hurting anybody... Do anything you want. You could kill Batman off for all I care, as long as it's going to make people feel loved. Yeah, now, man. I do hope to bring Batman, Batman back. <laughs> well, okay, bring that's a no-no circle. word. Just bring him <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Batman, though, Ben Affleck has confirmed that he has shot new Batman scenes for the Snyder Cut. This movie is going to be a new movie, not just a redo. <laughs> this is a whole new movie. Yeah, well, especially because it's now, like, four-ish hours which is a significant boost in, in runtime. We have Jared Leto coming back for to be Joker. We don't know if it's like... Not coming back. Like, he was never originally in the script. This is brand new. The other thing I read, by the way, is that this movie is going to have only about four-ish minutes of new content. Everything else will have already that was, been That shot. was debunked. No, no, that, oh, that was, was debunked. debunked. Okay, because yeah, I'm like... I, I don't understand. Because that's, that's just not possible. <laughs> That's not physically possible with the amount of things we've already been shown. That would mean that the trailer is the new Snyder Cut. So, no, that's not possible. Well, it's uh, not that the... it's – what I mean is what, – what, what I read was not that four new minutes, but, like, they will have to shoot four-ish minutes of content. Everything else they already had and had filmed and was not used in the theatrical cut. Oh, maybe. I'm not sure. I haven't seen anything about that. Uh, that but that, I agree. That, you that can't go from, like, like over source. two hours to four hours with four minutes of footage. Like, I, I understand that, Matt. <laughs> What what I'm trying to think of the last time a four hour movie was released that was received really well. Mm. Oh, The Irishman was like no, super really popular. Well. Oh my bad. Uh, The Irishman. How long is Django? Django not like four hours. Two and a half. No, like two and a half. I think. If you look at Infinity that. War and Endgame as one movie, which is not the case, but if you do that, people enjoy watching long movies. I don't know anybody who goes ninety minutes or I'm out. I've never met that person. I've met people who say, hey, I like to watch those long movies at home where I can pause it. Fine, that makes sense. But I've never met anybody who goes, I will not watch a four-hour movie. I've never met that person. And I've never met that comic book fan. That's for darn sure. I'm sure they're out there. I don't know them, though. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's why I said <laughs> I've never met them. But like, how often do There's you hear like, like a, in, in our circle like of friends series ish, right? Like four parts. Yeah. So it's yeah, not even exactly a movie. But like, how often do you hear like our circle of friends talk about? Oh, once a year, I watch the Lord of the Rings extended trilogy. Like people enjoy it. Mm-hmm. If it's if it's good, they'll watch it. People binge whole seasons of Netflix. Like it's people enjoy this stuff, and so I'm into I'm into a four hour movie. I'm also into two two hour movies. Whatever you want to do. Which was apparently the original plan was two a two two movie thing, yeah. Uh, Which is good. I, um, yeah. Just make make. I want more. I want more, and also better. Yes. Thank you. And this has been my TED talk. <laughs> Speaking of better, John, John, what news do you got? Uh, no, that four minutes was pretty much the news. But on an anecdotal side, I've been playing Sweat and Miles Morales, and it is amazing. So Ooh. far, what I'd heard seems to be true, and that it's. That's really good. It's really good and more fun than Spider Man, Marvel Spider Man from a few years ago because it's just like shorter, tighter, all killer. There's it doesn't like slow down. There's no valleys because it is a shorter experience. You know what? Let's go. I'm into it. Yeah, you should I just be. want to have a PS5 soon, Jeremy. Soon, I pray. This this has to be one of the worst launches in modern history oh, right? as far as like quantity. It's absolutely awful. Well, the the problem is not even the quantity because they had more PS5 units than PS4 units at that launch. This is going to be a little bit of a tangent here, but so they there was insane hype for PS5 before launch. There was going to be an E3, then there wasn't because of the pandemic. So then the hype built even more. Then they're like, don't worry, we understand, it's a whole mess. Uh, everyone's going to have a lot of time to place their pre-orders. Don't worry, we hear you guys, it's going to be fine. So then because of the pandemic, they had to, pre-orders were, had to be online. PS4, there was a window of time you were able to walk into a GameStop, a Best Buy, wherever, and place a pre-order. That did not exist with the PS5. Right. And then it went from, you have plenty of time, don't worry... Then they had another event where they showed a whole bunch of awesome games, and they and they revealed the physical console and what it looked like. And uh, then they're like, "Okay, so here's the thing." And then they didn't touch pre-orders. Then it was after that event, immediately after that event, they said, "Don't worry, pre-orders are going to go live. They're going to go live tomorrow." Everyone's like, "Well, one day isn't exactly a ton of time, but like, thanks for the heads up. I'm going to go to bed now." Then some stores got impatient and went live that night. So so it was that. And the problem is because it was online, every step of the way, every consumer has to deal with resellers and bots. Like there's no way to limit it. So that's the issue that's going on with the PS5. It's a miserable, miserable rollout. Very similar things with the Xbox Series S and X. The difference with that is it's not exactly significantly easier to get an Xbox over a PlayStation, but Microsoft's communication was it was very clear, very consistent, and did not contradict itself. They say you have a lot of time to do pre-orders. They gave you a lot of time to, to figure out your pre-order. They told you exactly when it would go live, and it did not go live early. Like, Microsoft's communication was very consistent, on point, and honest, whereas Sony's, I don't think it was intentional, but it turned out to not be true at almost every turn. I didn't realize it was all that It was, all of it that was nonsense. bad. It was very bad. I was following it. And I was living it. Uh, to be honest, my sister placed my order. She had my card. I was busy. That's how I got the PS5. <laughs> that you know what? Though you got your PS5, and that's great. Yeah, I made the choice to limit myself to only being able to buy it from GameStop because I sold stuff to GameStop and have GameStop credit sitting on a card, which is very so, like, fiscally smart, especially because with the PS5, you get the PS4 collection which gives you a ton of games that you probably had and or traded in and or wanted to play anyway, as well as because it's so backwards compatible, you don't really need both devices. So that's a fiscally responsible decision. Never fault anyone for making that decision. But I have to wait now. And I have had opportunities to get them other places. I mean, it probably wouldn't have gotten it anyway, but like, man, oh man, it stinks. Like when you see like, oh, uh, Costco's live or so-and-so's live. Amazon's live. It's like, yep, I'm not even going to bother because I don't have Costco money. I don't have Amazon money. <laughs> like, I, let me play the game. I hear you, man. I hear you. I just want to pay them to let me play something. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> and like Illinois is going into a lockdown again. By the time this episode comes out, we'll be in a lockdown. Like, just let me play video games with this. And again, first world problem. Well, I know. I am less... absolutely <laughs> complaining about something that doesn't matter. But I'm gonna complain <laughs> because I can. Not exactly a lockdown, but like the the basic line is: if you don't have to, don't. Right. That's exactly. what they're saying. It's not an actual order to stay at home. It's just like if you don't have to, don't do it. Mm-hmm. Which is what people should have been doing the whole time, but it's fine. Again, it could be like and I, we haven't. I don't fine. think we have said this on this podcast. <laughs> if you just wear your mask, our lives, our lives, lives, our lives will be so much closer to quote unquote normal. Than they have been. If everyone, it literally, if everyone just wore a mask, Japan never had a lockdown. Japan never had like a full shutdown. They just kept going. They, they were a little bit more careful, but they just wear their masks. And you know how many people are dying in Japan? A heck of a lot less. Oh, there's less people in Japan. But their density of population is so much higher than ours, and they're still able to get through this. Granted, there are still people who are sick and dying in Japan. I'm not saying that. But the numbers are lower percentages because they just do what they're supposed to do. We live in a country that is so selfish, it's unbelievable, says the guy whining about a PS5. I know that. But my PS5 whining doesn't hurt anybody else. You not wearing a mask can kill people. Stop Correct. being selfish. Wear what I will say about Japan is they have had mask culture as a norm for years. So wearing a yes, mask wasn't true. exactly a new thing in Japan. That's true. That's true. But it's 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 proof to the to us. They are they have it right right now in this regard. I they agree. are they it's correct. It's not that hard. It's I have worked out oh, in my mask. I, agree. I have skated on the ice multiple times on mask. It's not that hard to breathe. Is it uncomfortable? Yeah. But you know what? Some clothing's uncomfortable. You don't see me going naked to Walmart. Just wear your mask. Well there was there was a nurse who was like, if I can administer CPR to a patient with a mask on you can go to the grocery store with a mask on. It's not yeah. that hard. I, it's, ugh. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not that hard. We're just is... so frustrated that it's like we're going into Thanksgiving is next week as of the recording of this podcast. And like, Happy Thanksgiving. Remember March, February? Yeah, doing it again. <gasps> I, don't even have a place, I, don't, I don't even have a PlayStation to play. Uh, let's stop talking about lockdown. Let's talk about lock and key in hey. the poll list. Here's your pull list. This week on the pull list, we are talking about Joe Hill's Lock and Key. Uh, Lock and Key is written by Joe Hill, who is Stephen King's son, and it's drawn by Gabriel Rodriguez. First and foremost, John, what did you expect from this book? We talked about it off air, but I want to, I want the I want the public to hear what you were thinking initially. So I didn't know much about this book, this so-called book. But given that there was like a Netflix series, I didn't expect what i got i expected not just like, a netflix series a netflix series that looks more like series of unfortunate events than it does hill house right i expected something a little more kid friendly and like more like spooky and like ooh, there's like a cult than like some of the more serious topics that we'll delve into here yeah this is a this is a book man it this was is, this is a graphic novel it was very heavy and I was not in the headspace for it. Unfortunately, that I didn't enjoy it because I was not in the mood for something like this at all. Conversely, I love this stuff. So I absolutely love this book. And it is very dark and it is very grim. And I think we should put a... I'm going to put a content warning at the beginning of this episode. Um, because this does have some some themes... I'll put, I'll put it at the beginning of the pull list so people can skip the pull list if they want. But there are some themes and some things that are less than enjoyable for other... The, the trigger warnings would need to be made for this episode, but I really enjoy this book. I, I like Joe Hill's writing. He is definitely Stephen King's son. This felt very in that vein, and I loved it. But let's just jump right into the book. So this book opens up with... It starts with a door in the men... Mendo, Mendocino? Mendocino Valley? I don't know. I, I'm not from the West Coast. And our two boys are knocking on the door with a hatchet and It does and say that gun. this is before. This is a flashback to events that have already happened. So it's a Tarantino book. And they are looking for Mr. Locke. They say they meet Mrs. Locke, and Mrs. Locke says, oh, well, he's, you know, he's not here. Uh, is there anything that you need? Like, oh, we just, he's our counselor from school, and we wanted to say hello. 
he said if we're in the area we should say hi and she goes oh okay well that's great he's not here at the second one just hold on uh, oh great by the way great pickup truck and they say oh yeah it's uh, it's you know it's, uh, it's my uncle he doesn't mind and like the one guy's clutching oh oh yeah he's one guy's an axe the other guy's a gun and in the back of the truck are two dead bodies. So the people who had the truck are murdered in the back of the truck. We then see Ty, who is the oldest brother in the Locke family. He's hanging out at the edge of the creek with his sister and his younger brother. And the younger brother, you know, makes a comment that, hey, I had a turtle in my hand, but he pooped in my hand and then he left. So right off the bat, I'm like, okay, this is going to be not necessarily, like the guy has a gun and there's a dead body. Like It's not going to be dark. Be dour. Yeah, I was expecting a little bit of happiness. Nay, nay. We immediately cut from the kids complaining that they have to do work. And Before we cut, though, I do like this scene with the water, where Ty's in the water. is like, man, I don't want to be here. This is stupid. But he looks in. He's like, I could be with so-and-so in California, doing California things. And he's like, totally, like, beach bum outfit. He's like, or I could be with, like, my emo friend going to shows every night. And he's like, totally emoed out and that's interrupted by uh, Bode, the younger brother with the turtle so i like the just the reflection part of like him seeing how he views himself and how he views himself like the possibilities of himself in the war that's explored throughout and i liked it yes the reflections are a thing in this book so we have ty we have Bodie, and we have kinsey the three locks uh three lock kids and they are like i said so they're out in this the country, not where they normally live, but they're spending some time here for the summer helping their dad uh, with quote-unquote free labor, as Ty says. And Ty's a pretty general, angsty teen, you know, oh, my dad's so stupid, I want to do this work, which is very, very normal. I think that everybody goes through a phase where they think their parents are dumb and they know best. Unfortunately, what happens here is while they're sitting near the river and they're talking, the two people who went to the front door are there to kill Mr. Locke. They, the people, the guy with the gun and the guy with the axe are there to kill Mr. Locke. He yep. steps into the house and he sees the home invasion. Uh, Sam Lesser and Al Grubb are their names. And they are there to kill Mr. Locke. And they do so. And the reason we know that they do so is because we go from the lakes or the riverside to Mr. Locke walking in the door to immediately a funeral. With Mr. Locke's ashes sitting on at the funeral. And it says now. So this, this is now the present is the funeral. What I love about this particular panel is everything behind. So the, the background is all gray and brown. Everyone in the foreground is wearing black and white. That's it. Even the colors of people's hairs are incredibly muted. The area surrounding the urn is white and black with like marble. Again, muted. But the urn is a bright crimson like a red that stands out against everything. Yeah, everything has a muted color palette except... It looks yeah. very cool. Tyler sits down at his dad's funeral thinking about, oh, what am I going to do? He actually talks to the two people that he wished he was with when his dad died. The person who lives on the island and the person who goes to concerts all the time. Neither one of them can cheer him up. He then, his uncle comes and sits next to him, Mr. Locke's brother. Tyler remembers a time when he was much younger, and he sees his parents kind of drinking and talking about how they want to go back to the to Key House and live with Duncan. Duncan is the uncle. And he's like, oh, yeah, Duncan, he has the place. It's, oh, man, it chose him. It didn't choose me. Ty walks away, but he remembers this. He remembers this because Duncan is saying, hey, I know you probably don't want to talk about this right now, but... You're going to come live with me now that your dad is dead. And Ty cries onto his uncle's shoulder. Because that's the most secure place there is. Uh, we cut back to before again. And we see Ty, Bodie, and Kinsey walking up to the house. And a big blam! A gunshot has gone off. This is Sam has killed Mr. Locke. Al is in the other room doing something. He is currently uh, pulling his pants back up. You see blood on the walls and you see Mrs. Locke's clothing. Strewn about so, some of its clothing, some uh, some implied rape. Yes, uh, it's implied again later, but this is one hundred percent. They Al Grubb assaulted, sexually assaulted, and raped Mrs. Locke uh, at the same time that Mr. Locke was being murdered by Sam. Yeah, I just was not ready. Abs no, I absolutely, for this kind absolutely. Of <laughs> the outside ty knocks over some paint cans which alerts the two intruders to their presence uh, sam goes after ty ty leaves some footprints that go down into the cellar 
while Kinsey takes Bodie on top of the house to hide away from the murderers. We cut back to now. This happens for a little while, but at a certain point, we just are caught up completely. Driving out to Massachusetts, and they're driving out to Massachusetts, and they are going to a place called Lovecraft. Now, the title of the, so the title of the book, Volume 1, is Welcome to Lovecraft. I assumed that was like a general, like, Welcome to Lovecraft, the genre, or Welcome to Lovecraft as an idea. Not Welcome to Lovecraft, Massachusetts, which is not a real place. Yeah, I... That was also the thing, too, is I just didn't... I expected more, like, creepy, otherworldly, like, unsightly horror, and that's not really what this book so is So Lovecraft, all. just to take a pause here, Lovecraft has really taken on more of cosmic horror and horror that's not explained. And I think this book does a pretty good job of that with the Echo Woman and Ghost Leaving Your Body and the Keys. From what I found, the definite... Like, what Lovecraft means is... Frighteningly monstrous and otherworldly, sometimes with terrifying unnatural anatomy. Yeah, what Lovecraft has become to mean is cosmic, unexplainable horror. So the genre of Lovecraftian horror has evolved over time from its initial. The initial Lovecraft stuff is the undescribable terrors, and you go insane, and you become useless to society. And thank goodness, we as a culture have moved past the Lovecraftian ideas of... You are useless to society if you go, uh, quote-unquote, insane. And that's good. But they've taken some of the good things from Lovecraftian writing, and they've kept it, and they've altered, and they've evolved, and I'm a big fan of Lovecraftian horror, both the original and the updated. I will say, Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft, was a piece of human garbage who we should not look up to. His creations are their own thing. And the genre that he created... Tell us how you really I mean, he's a He literally had a cat that was just named the N-word. His, his cat was oh. just named that word. He made many villains in his books brown people because they're not white. He was a bad guy. <laughs> the genre that he created has evolved past him. Thank goodness. There's a lot of really good subversive Lovecraft stuff now that is people of color doing Lovecrafting horror which honestly is not only a slap in the face to him but it's just like a a hell yes and k jemison or jessamine who did far sector green lantern far sector wrote one of my favorite people of color lovecraftian books called the city we became check it out phenomenal book about the five boroughs of new york becoming human it's awesome anyway <laughs> back to this lovecraft is literally a place here so i would assume that in this universe H.P. Lovecraft never existed. On Lovecraft, or in Lovecraft, there is this island. It is an island. And a massive chunk of the island is owned by the Locks. And when I say a massive chunk, I'm talking like, looking at this island, a third of the island is just the Locks' estate. A uh, key house. Yeah, it's gigantic. Key house is also amazing. Beautiful gothic architecture. Like, it looks like Hill House or the house in Winchester... It's beautiful. Looks like f at least four full floors with many parts of the house rising above yeah. that. It, 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 maybe, it, it looks kind of like there was an initial part of the house, and then they built on, and then they built on, and then they built on. So they get to this place uh, with whatever. The uncle. They, they, they are, they've gotten to Key House with the uncle. And initially, they just say they are going to live with the uncle. They don't say who. I thought the mom was dead at this point. She's not. Mrs. Locke survived the attack. She does walk with a cane now, but she survived the attack. And that is important for later. So they get there. Is it Rendell? Rendell. No, Rendell is, -E Rendell is Duncan? Duncan. Rendell is the dad. The, de the dead dad. Got it. Thank got you, John. Got it, got it, got it, got it. So they, they get to there no and they're like, hey, mom says, hey, you know what? Before we unhaul the U-Haul, everyone take 10 minutes. We've been in a car forever. They drove cross country, I believe, from the West Coast to here. So everyone take a rest, Yep. go take 10 minutes, and go. So Bodie goes to explore, Ty goes to walk around and be very upset, and we don't know why Ty is so upset. I mean, we know that he's upset because his dad is gone, but he's taking this harder than the rest of the family, it seems, and we're not sure why yet, but we're about to get a reason. So we cut back to before again, and Sam has chased Ty down to the basement to kill him. And he says, come on, Ty, don't play hide and seek. I did this for you, remember? We talked about it. 
That time I said I wanted to kill my dad, you said, well, you know what you said. I felt a connection. And at that point, Ty bashes Sam's face in with a brick. And he goes back upstairs to try to save his dad. Sees Al there. He does take out the gun. And Al says, that's fine. You know, that gun's only got so many shots in it. They're all used up. I know that. I counted. So I'm just going to kill you. But before Al can kill Tyler, Mrs. Locke comes out from the back bedroom with her clothes all torn, especially in the legs and the back where the sexual assault had occurred. And she kills Al with an axe to the back of the head. But it's too late Mr. Locke has already been killed. That's one of the reasons why Ty feels so sad. He couldn't stop it. But we're going to find out later that Ty has some other guilt resting with him. Yeah, he was looking at the himself and the, 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 the water on this estate. Not the same creek, but water on this estate. And in real life, he's him wearing his street clothes. In the reflection, he's wearing the same outfit he had on that day with a gun and a brick in his two hands, all covered in blood. So he sees himself as a murderer, as a monster. And then, to converse that, after he's done remembering his mom killing Al, he sees himself, yeah, looking at his dead dad, then looking at his dead dad's picture, and then looking at the water again. So the water and the reflection and the duality kind of comes through this book multiple times. Kinsey says uh, to, to Ty, like, hey, do you want to come pick bedrooms? You know, you're the oldest, so you get to pick first. He's like, no, I don't really care. Which is, you know, what's holding you together? I mean, I've cried a bunch, but, like, you were Dad's favorite. And he says, whatever I was to Dad, it wasn't worth it. He really feels horrible about something. And like John said, there's the image of him seeing himself as a murderer. But again, there's something coming. Bodie's in the house. Uh, and they, they say, hey, where's Bodie? Ah, it's only been, like, five minutes. He couldn't have killed himself yet. Well... He has stacked a bunch of books about, I'm going to say, five feet high, and is reaching for a literal sword. Yeah, taller than him, for sure. Like, reaching for a literal sword on a stack of books. This child is like 10 years old. (laughs) It's... Yeah. Woo! He spots something out of the corner of his eye that's cooler than the sword. So he knocks the swords down and jumps off the books. Again, could easily die. He then stacks more books and a stool which is even more precarious, and gets a broom and knocks something off the mantle or off of the door arch. And it's a key. What is this strange key? He puts it immediately into the lock, and I guess we'll see what that's all about. We cut then to a prison. Sam Lesser is in jail, and he is hearing a... He's like, there's this weird echo. Don't you hear it? It's perfect. And he looks into the water because more reflection, and he sees a man's face. And the man's face... So he's talking to this man's face. He goes, where were you? I I did everything you asked. You said you'd give me a new home and a new face. And he goes, well, you do have a new home and a new face. Talking about the new home, prison, the new face. They reconstructed your face after it was beaten with a brick. So that's not, you promised it'd be better. He goes, I I always keep my promises. But you're going to have to wait. But don't worry, your cell door will be one of the first to open. And Sam says, when? And the face fades away into the water. So Sam was told to kill Mr. Locke by something. I don't know what that is yet. We cut back to Bodie opening that door, and he steps through the door outside. It's just outside. And as soon as he steps through... And dies. Literally dies. (laughs) Not a metaphor. The kid is dead. His spirit leaves his body, turns around and goes, that's my body. Sees the body is like, like, splayed out, eyes bugged open, like, not comfortable. He goes, "Uh uh-oh, goes back into the body, and he's like, well, that's weird. So, like any child would do on the first day of school, what I did this summer, he writes a comic. I'm going to read you the little comic because it's really messed up. It is very messed up. This is about the point where I'm like, yeah, I'm not feeling this book right now at all. Uh, Panel one, bad guys shot my daddy. Uh, And then it shows his dad being killed. Panel two, so my mom and Uncle Duncan drove us across the USA. I saw 1,000 cows and my older sister bought me an Indian spear, but it broke. Moo. There's a picture of them driving across uh, the, st- the country, and there's a cow. Panel three. Now we live in a big house named Key House. Pretty self-explanatory. Panel four. I found a secret door, and when you go through, you turn into a ghost. It's fun to be a dead person. Maybe I will see Dad's ghost sometime. Uh, panel five, we don't know what it says, because it's covered up by a note. Yeah, the note is basically, this is not acceptable. Can I talk with it's you? not acceptable. Please? Hey, 
is he okay? This is sent home to mom. Mom's like, oh my God, what am I going to do with this boy? Duncan, I, thank you for everything. I really appreciate you. I know you really haven't had time to grieve, but thank you for letting us come stay with you here. Thank you for everything. He's like, you know what? Honestly, if I hadn't been kept busy, I probably would have been, I probably would have broken down at this point. Uh, I don't know what to do with the kids either, but it's going to be okay. And they talk about, you know, is this okay for Bodie to be thinking these things? Because, you know, when we were kids, Rendell and I used to run around this house. This is their childhood home. We just run around this house, and when we'd cross through a door, we would pretend we were a different creature of some sort. So maybe Bodie's just playing a game. She goes, yeah, well, maybe, but I don't know. Bodie, you know Bodie. That's a real morose game to be playing. <laughs> yeah, she's like, you know Bodie. He lives in a complete fantasy world. And Bodie overhears this because he's a ghost floating above them. He returns back to his body, uh, but not before explaining to us, the audience, what it's like to be a ghost. And when you're a ghost, you can imagine someone or something, and you just go there immediately. So he thinks about his brother, and his brother happens to be in the shower, and he he kind of like leans in front of the water, and the water gets very cold because he's a ghost. Then he thinks about his sister, and his sister is imagining... Uh, she's having uh, like a PTSD flashback of holding him, hiding the both of them from the murderers when the people were killing their dad. And he tries to tell them this. Hey, you know, I, I saw you uh, on your bed. I saw you in the shower. And they're like, hey, that's creepy. You're a weirdo. And no one believes that he's actually a ghost, except for mom. Mom is willing to listen to him, but she goes, hey, can you, like, not draw comics? Like, you can think whatever you want, buddy, and I love you, but maybe you don't draw the comics. And he's like, yeah, okay. Okay, I love you. And she leaves him to, to fish because he's fishing by himself because no one wants to hang out with him right now. He's fishing in the in the little lake pond thing pool, and uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty amazing gadget. Uh, I'll let him explain it. He says, "I made the ultimate treasure finder using a fishing rod and advanced science. It's kind of technical. It's a it's a magnet attached to a fishing rod. I do love <laughs> Bodie. He's great. Oh yeah, he's the the sunshine through this whole through this book. And he whistles, and he hears a whistle come back. And he says hello, and he hears the word hello come back." And he, he finds it's coming from the well house. And a well house, what a well house is, is back in the day, a well house is where you'd get your water from. It's protected from the environment, stuff like that. This particular well house is uh, decrepit and broken, and no one's supposed to go in there. But Bodhi can kind of slip through the, the bars in the window, and he, he goes over to the well. And he says, hello? You later find out in like a throwaway line that this well house doesn't really serve any practical function because you can't like the water that's down there like is undrinkable or and or there like is no like next to no water so it really just serves at no practical point there's no legitimate reason it should be there so he walks in to this well house and he's, he he says hello and the well says hello back but it's kind of an echo and he goes are you my echo and from the well you hear yes i am and he sprints out. He's like, nope, 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 nope. And the well says, no, wait, please come back. And he attempts to come back with his brother and his sister. And they don't believe him. He says, no, there's really somebody down there. And go, if there was really somebody down there, they'd be dead. There's no way. The dust on the floor has one set of footprints, and that's yours. There's nobody down there, Bodhi. And Bodhi says, ugh, you're not listening to me. And he goes to sleep, and he dreams about his dead dad. And he dreams about a dog scratching the the floor, and the dad tries to tell him a knock-knock joke. And this is a dead dad, mind you. He says, hey, Bodhi, want to hear a knock-knock joke? And dad says, dad? He says, you're supposed to say who's there. And Bodhi wakes up. All a dream. He does go to the well again, but this time as a ghost, because he doesn't want to go there as a full body. And he goes in the well, and he sees this, this woman attempting to brush her hair. And the woman says, oh, Bodhi, is that you? Are you playing ghost? I, I can tell you're there. I can't see you. But if you could please come back as, you know, you and a body, I would really appreciate it because I haven't had a friend in so long. Now, now, John, you hate dolls and little kids and scary movies, right? Uh-huh. When was the last time in any media, with the exception of, like, Puff the Magic Dragon and Pete's Dragon... Wait, neither of which I've seen... Good, that works perfectly then. When was the last time you saw some media where somebody says to a little kid, I just want to be your friend, that it worked out? Uh, I don't know. Uh, never. Maybe, like... Show me never on the board. Ding. Number one answer. Yeah, it, yeah. No, I can't think of a Nobody has time. to say, I want to be your friend. If you actually want to be someone's friend, you just become friends. 
But when anybody tries to coerce a little kid, I'm like, ah, oh, you're evil. So, like, right away, I got this bad feeling about this well lady. And Bodhi talks to the well lady about how, you know, she's been down there forever. And, you know, when his dad used to live here, she talked to him too. But there's no, there's no reason for her to be down there. She can't leave. He says, what do you mean you can't leave? She goes, well, I can leave the well, technically. But I can't leave the door because I'm a ghost. I'm a spirit. I'm an echo. But you need to find the key that lets me out. He goes, oh, like the key that lets me become a ghost. She's like, yes, like the key that lets you become a ghost. If you can find the key that lets me out, I can leave. And that'd be great. And he's like, that's cool. Well, I don't have that key. So that's fine. But if you find it, let me know. And he goes, well, I did bring you the two things you wanted, which are a mirror and a scissors so you can cut your hair. And she goes, oh, awesome. Thank you. And she goes, okay, bye. Bye, Echo. And she goes, oh, bye, Bodhi. When Bodhi leaves, she goes, yes, Bodhi. These are perfect. And she's looking in the mirror. And it's a totally different face. And it's really scary. And I don't like it. Nor should you. And immediately, we then go back to the prison where it's called San Lobo. Now, for those of us who are not very cultured, what that means is the wolf. Uh Wolf prison. And I'm just putting this together now, but this must be something that comes up later in the other books. Because we don't really see anything happen with it now, but I'm assuming I'm going to read the rest of these books because I'm in love with them. I'm assuming this comes in later. So we see Sam Lesser in there, and the reflection is talking to him again and says, Hey, got you some stuff. The keys to your cell. And it's the scissors and the mirror that Bodhi just dropped off. <gasps> what? Oh, my God. And that's the That's chapter two. Chapter three is all about Kinsey. And... As much as I like this chapter, it's very easily summed up. Because not a lot happens in this chapter, at least as far as Kinsey goes. This chapter focuses on Kinsey dealing with the grief. Focusing on how she had to stay silent and hold Bodhi and keep him silent when the murderers were there to prevent them from being found. And she has to change her looks. So when she was in California, she had dreads a ton of piercings, and she wore, like, a lot of political shirts. She changes her look completely to be very unassuming. Plain. Yeah, plain. Because she doesn't want people to notice her. She doesn't want to be noticed. She she wants to just be a shadow on the wall, and that's just easier for her. The one thing that she will do that stands out is track. She's very good at track, but she won't get close to anybody on the track team. She just, she won't. She, it, she's scared to. At the same time that Kinsey's giving us her lowdown on how she's dealing with the grief, we see Sam escape from prison. The, re, the way he escapes from prison is he uses the mirror to look for who's coming, and then when they get close, he stabs the guard with both ends of the scissors, pulls the guard in, and unlocks the gate to escape. Very brutal. We also see a brutal image of Ty. Uh, the way Ty is dealing with all of the grief is he's he's just putting it all into labor. He's working on p- uh, paving. He's working on the landscaping. He's do anything to keep himself busy. And we see from his perspective, he's laying bricks on a new path. And he sees Sam Messer, Lesser underneath him, bloodied from the brick. He can't escape this. We then see Kinsey and Bodie. And John, I apologize if I'm taking up the brunt of the talking. Feel free to jump in any time. No, no, no. I appreciate it. Okay. I very much enjoyed this book, so I'm very excited to talk about it. And I understand that you also weren't (laughs) in the right headspace for this book, so I I didn't want to. I didn't want to force you to talk too much. But let me know if there's any time you want to jump in. So Bodhi and Kinsey are walking. Bodhi's like, "You gotta come see. I can turn into a ghost." And we see from Kinsey's perspective that he opens the door and goes, "Eh," and then lays on the floor. And she's like, "That's you're weird." And she leaves. And she goes back. She's like, "Okay, you can stop now." And this goes on for. Fun game. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven panels. And I would say these panels are like ellipses in a novel. And you can tell that time passed. This isn't him for like three seconds sitting there. This is like two and a half pages. And two and a half pages in a comic book, I'm going to equate to like 45 seconds to a minute. That's a long time to sit there and not move. And she's like, okay, are you actually dead? I don't like this. And he goes, (gasps) mom's talking to the guy whose name means born at night. And she's like, what? Are you insane? And she runs out to go tell her mom. And her mom's talking to a, a cop. And the cop, uh, she, she, the mom's like, hey, Kinsey, can you can you go? I got to talk to this detective, uh, Matuku, for a minute. Just please, I'll, I'll come talk to you. Uh, McKinsey then overhears the conversation through the vents in the house, like any kid would do, you know, spy a little bit. They find out that Sam has escaped. And he is... They don't know where he is. 
The officer reassures them, hey, you know what? Most guys who escape from prison are recaptured within 24 hours, and it's like three miles away. So don't worry. He's not going to come for you. He has no idea where you are. Also, you're across the country. Why would he be coming east? We then do see Sam is in the back of a truck in Wyoming, which is further east than California, meaning he is coming east. East. Kinsey goes back to her mom and her mom. It's noted her mom never wears anything that isn't black. She looks a lot like Death or not Death, uh, Sleep or Sandman from the Sandman books, Neil Gaiman Sandman books. But in the initial part before the attack, she's wearing like bright blue and like like summery colors, but she only wears black in the time I see her in this book now. Kinsey's like, hey mom. And mom's like, how much did you hear? She's like, I heard all of it. Okay. And they hug and they're scared. And they say, so there's cops here now. So yeah, if you want, the cops will take you. He goes, no, I don't want to be seen. That that would make me a target of ridicule and eyes. I don't want that. And she's like, yeah, well, you know, don't worry. We're going to be okay. There's no way Sam can come get us. And they're talking, they're talking. And Kinsey ends the conversation with, with, so you said Matuku, right? That's his name? She goes, yeah, that's kind of like a an African sounding name, isn't it? And mom says, well, yeah, I actually asked him about that. It actually means uh, born at night, which is what Bodhi said. So Kinsey's kind of like, hmm, maybe this ghost thing is real. She then goes to school the next day to go talk to her track coach. And everyone's kind of watching her out of the corner of their eyes. If you look hard, if you just glance at the picture, no one's necessarily looking at her. But if you look hard, every single set of eyes that are visible on the book are looking at Kinsey. Because, small town, if there's cops outside your house... The news is going to travel fast. She goes to talk to the cops, and uh, she sees uh, fresh paint, and she smells fresh paint, and she throws up. The dad, when he was murdered, was painting the house. Yeah, they were there to paint. So this is like a very shocking, traumatic memory. And the cop, the officer, not the officer, the coach is like, you know, hey, I understand. You're okay. You're going through a lot. Don't let this affect you. And she's like, well, you know. I don't want to be stared at. You know, it is what it is. You're strong. You're going to be okay. And she sees this bracelet on Kinsey's arm. And the bracelet is from her dad. And she goes, yeah, my dad gave it to me. Uh, and it's got a key on the bracelet and like uh, inscribed in it. And she says, yeah, my dad said it was like a reminder. Believing in yourself is the key to being a complete person. If you've got the key, it can unlock any door and take whatever you need to go. Yada, yada. He was a super cornball, but you know, he was my dad. Anyway, coach, thanks. I feel a lot better. And the coach's like, yeah, no, see ya. And the coach immediately goes and pulls her yearbook down. And you see Rendell, Locke, and her. And Rendell is wearing this bracelet. She's like, hmm, okay. And you also see, I'm just noticing this now, a particular black-haired, raven-haired gentleman named Lucas yeah. Caravaggio. Caravaggio? Do we have- yeah, he caught my eye. Because like it's it, it that character model just really stands out from the others in my opinion, and I'm like, all right, whatever. It's also important to notice Lucas is looking directly at Kim Topher, or not Kim Topher, yeah, Kim Topher, who is uh, the coach we're led to believe. Now, could you do me a quick favor, John? Could you Google Caravaggio and see if that means anything? Boy, can I! Kinsey then talks more about how she's you know scared every time she looks in a mirror or scared every time she looks in a window and she sees her face she says you know what i'm not gonna be scared anymore and during track practice a girl was like hey do you want to be like you want to like run with me on saturdays and kim's like no i can't because that means you might talk to me and that means i have to talk and i bye so kinsey then is saying that you know, I'm, I'm sick of being scared when i look in the mirror i am gonna take control over myself she cuts her hair up and she changes her look and she goes to that girl's house and is like hey i'm sorry about it earlier do you want to run Basically extending an olive branch, hey, I would like to have another human being in my life. So Caravaggio is the surname of Michelangelo of both Ninja Turtle and paint, Renaissance Painter fame. Interesting. Interesting. I wonder if that'll come into play later. Because his name is Michael Caravaggio, isn't it? Uh, the f- No, it's is Lucas. It it's Lucas. It's Lucas. Lucas? Luke, uh, biblical name. You know, probably some meaning there. I don't know. We then open up on chapter four, which is uh, opens up with Bodhi seeing his dead dad uh, rise in the body bag and says, uh, you know, Bodhi, knock, knock. Bodhi says, who's there? And the dad says, who? And we see the horrible bullet wound in the dad's eye. And Bodhi wakes up, who, who? And he's 
freaked out. We then see a horrible scene of uh, Sam being driven across the country in a truck. A different truck than he was in before. So he's obviously switched rides. And the trucker is sexually assaulting Sam. Because uh, in exchange for the ride... He needs Sam needs to give him sexual favors. He's like, oh man, that's that's horrible. That's he uh, he lives by the book, so to speak. If you've seen uh, Dogma, not Dogma, James and Bob Strike Back. Thank you, John. No problem. This is where we get Sam's backstory, and we see that Sam had uh, a alcoholic, uh, drug addicted mother, an abusive father, and Sam was just abused everywhere. Sam also appears to just be very very intelligent he scored 600 on or 1600 on his sats i believe it's 600 on his sats 600s i don't know what that means because i don't i never I took, we, had, we had the act yeah same here he, he he scored well he did score well that is important he but he's he's socially awkward He's... Isn't like eight hundred like stellar? I thought, thought sixteen hundred was stellar. But don't you get like eight hundred on something, eight hundred on another, and that would equal sixteen hundred, which is perfect? Sure, that makes sense to me. So, so twelve hundred is probably very good. Yes, awesome. I'm very happy we figured this out. <laughs> All I know is on the ACT, a thirty-two <laughs> is perfect, and I did not get a thirty-two. <laughs> All I know is your school usually does A or B and seldom both. So we see Sam's upbringing. It was very rough. Uh, and uh, we also see the day that he meets Al, the guy that he committed the attack with. And he meets him outside of Mr. Locke's office. And Sam says, oh, yeah, Mr. Locke is helping me uh, with, you know, college and stuff. And Al says, yeah, well, he's helping me with uh, getting out of this school and going into vocational. So Al is obviously not somebody who wants to be in school. He wants to be in a vocational trade, which is great. But then Al makes some strange comments about Mrs. Locke, Mr. Locke's wife, about how she obviously wants it because she flaunts her sexuality in front of me. So she obviously wants me to have sex with her, which is the talk of a, a rapist and a serial killer. Obviously, that's not yeah, true. Yeah, like the first time, I'm like, okay, it's a one-off. But after the next five times... We then see Tyler storm out of his dad's office like, you can't control me, dad! Because again, typical teenager. We then cut back to Lovecraft again. Lovecraft, Massachusetts. Where Ty is in a shed alone, maybe like contemplating suicide, looking up at the shotgun, till Bode comes in. Bodie. And he's and Ty realizes, I, I can't do it for the sake of Bode. Bodie. Bodie is the reason I could never actually do it. And Bodie's like, hey, Ty, can I tell you a knock-knock joke and maybe you can help explain it to me? And he says, yeah, I guess. He goes, okay, okay, knock-knock. And uh, Ty says, who's there? And he goes, who? He goes, who, who? And he goes, right. What's the rest? And Ty goes, the rest? What are you, what are you some kind of owl? Get it? Who, who? Are you an owl? And Bodie goes, is that it? That's all that means? He goes, yeah, it's not a great joke. Bodie's like, ugh, this is dumb. And Ty's like, yeah, all right. So it doesn't mean anything? He's like, no, it's a joke. I'm like, ugh. And then Ty's like, you know what? I've had enough. It's, I miss you, Dad. It's so hard without you. No matter what I said to Sam, I didn't want you to die. We then cut back to Sam in the truck with the truck rapist. And he's like, hey, you know, you did things for me. You'd probably need money to get to your next place. Uh, you could post up in that bathroom where there's a hole and you could do other things and then people will pay you. And Sam doesn't say anything. And I'm like, oh, that's horrible. We then cut back to before where Sam is with Mr. Locke in the guidance counselor's office. Uh, it hasn't been noted. Mr. Locke is a guidance counselor. Mr. Locke's like, hey, yeah, Sam, congratulations on doing well. But uh, we got to talk. And he says, yes, Mr. Locke, did you get the chance to do the the uh, letter recommendation for me? He goes, oh, yeah, about that. We'll talk. Hey, are your parents ever going to come talk to me? He goes, oh, yeah, they're just really busy deflecting. And they see a painting on the wall. And it's the well house from, from uh, Lovecraft, from the key house. And he says, who, is, who painted this? And Mr. Locke says, oh, it's my little brother painted that. He says, oh, it's, it's very pretty. Where is it? Says, oh, it's uh, up in Massachusetts. Old M.A., uh, where I'm from. Uh, key house, where I'm from. Yeah, it's beautiful. And Sam sees in the window of this painting, which shouldn't be happening, the painting's moving, a woman writing, help me, on the bars of the well house. This is the same woman who is the quote-unquote echo who lives in the well. Mr. Locke says, you know what? I'm so sorry that I can't write you this letter of recommendation, but you need emotional support. You are not ready for college. You are not doing well. And I'm more than willing to help you find this help, but I cannot recommend you go to college yet. You just, you need more support. And Sam says, okay. Doesn't react. 
But we, we obviously we know that Sam is snapped at this point. Sam leaves the office and says, oh, hey, Ty, right? You're Mr. Locke's son. Is it okay if I sit here? He's like, yeah, I don't care. Don't talk to me. And he goes, oh, I saw you having that conversation with your dad. I get it, man. Dads are tough. Some days I think I should just kill my dad. And Ty, out of frustration, says, yeah, well, if you ever do that, do me a favor and kill mine too. And Sam goes, okay. You waiting for a ride? Ty says, yeah, I'm waiting for my yeah, dad to pick me up. Sam's like, don't throw me at a good time. What? 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 And we cut back to now. And Sam has killed the truck driver, taken all that truck driver's money, and gets on a bus. And he's going to take that bus all the way to Massachusetts. Coming back to Lovecraft again. Kinsey is working with her uncle to put away wine in the wine cellar because they have a literal wine cellar. It's beautiful. And Bodie's like, hey, guys, I have a joke. I need help. And then he tells a joke, knock, knock, who's there, who, who, what are you now? The uncle says, well, there's, you know, there's two versions of that joke, right? And Bodie says, what? No, I didn't know that. Says, What's the other, the other part of the joke is, uh, what are you, an echo? And Bodie goes, an echo? Hmm. And we cut back again to Sam on the bus. And he says, oh, there's a woman on this bus who's been eyeing me. And, uh, well, you know. I can see the future after all. I'm very good at predicting the future. I have to kill them all. Just like I did with him. And we cut back to Sam killing Mr. Locke. And he says, you know, give me the keys. Give me those keys. The anywhere key and the key to the black door. And Mr. Locke's like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, he goes, oh, yes, you grown-ups don't believe that's what they were told. Or that's what you were told. But you need to give me those keys. I'm not going to give you those keys. I'm going to get up. And if you need to, you need to kill me. And Sam obviously did. Just like he killed everyone on the bus. Because they were looking at him and they knew they were going to rat him out. So he gets to Massachusetts with the bus. He burns the whole bus. And he hops on a boat. And he steals that boat. And tells the driver of that boat, get me over to that island where Lovecraft is now. Cut back to Bodie. Or not cut back to, cut over to Bodie. Hanging out at the Echo. And he goes, you know what? You're not an Echo. I don't like you. I'm not coming back here ever again. You're a bad guy. Yeah, like you said, you're my echo, but like, I think you existed before then, so you're not like my echo. Like this, this whole thing's just not right. So you know, I wasn't even gonna come talk to you tonight, but it is what it is. Like you just, I'm done with you forever. I'm never coming back. And this next part legitimately gave me chills, and I, I'm actually having trouble looking at it now. So someone from up the hill, uh, Kinsey's Bodie. You have ten minutes, and you have to come inside. And Bodie's like looking off to the to Kinsey up on the hill, and we are looking over Bodhi's shoulder at the well, and the woman is out of the well coming towards Bodhi. And I seriously, I'm not making this up. It bothers me to look at that image. It, it scares me to look at that image. Well, it's very creepy. The The face is entirely wrapped in shadow. The creature is very bony and gaunt. Like, it's really creepy. Sam has killed the, the boat guy, the captain, uh, and has stolen the boat, and he's going to get to Lovecraft Island. Ty is watching TV, and the news is just, as the news is, horrible. There's nothing good on the news. You know? Yeah, it's a horrible story after horrible story after horrible story. And he's changing the channels. It's not like he's on one channel, or he's watching, oh no, he's watching one channel. He's waiting for sports to come on. But it just, it's over and over and over. And he's also burning his hand with a lighter, just to feel something. And Mom's like, hey, what are you up to? He's like, just waiting for sports to come on. And Kinsey goes down and talks to the cop who's watching their house. Like, hey, here's some food. Thank you for everything you're doing. And he's like, you know, don't worry. I'm here. There's so much water around that, like, he can't come get to you. You're going to be fine. If he is coming, but he's not. Just, you'll be okay. Everyone's going to be okay. And she, he says, oh, what you got there in the jar? And he goes, oh, fireflies. Bodie likes to run around at night. And I thought it'd be nice. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's awesome. But... It's not, he doesn't need the light. Nothing's going to happen to him in his own backyard. Well, something did happen to him in his own backyard. The woman has completely crawled out of the well and has grabbed Bodhi and has covered his mouth. If you promise not to scream, I won't have to kill you and throw you down the well. He says, fine, I'm, I won't scream, but what do you want? She goes, well, I need that key. I need the key to anywhere. He says, well, I don't know what that is. I don't know where the anywhere key is. She goes, well, that's the thing. You need to go find it. Your dad knew where it was, and he was very, very intelligent, but not as intelligent as Sam. And he goes, Sam? He goes, yeah, he's coming. And I can stop Sam, but you need to get me that key. If you don't get me the key, Sam's probably going to kill your whole family tonight. And Bodie's like, what are you talking about? She goes, oh, I think it's already started. And Sam is very much there, 
and he attacks Kinsey and beats her over the head of the flashlight until she's unconscious. Goes down and traps uh, the mom and the uncle in the wine cellar because they were in there reorganizing and tells them, hey, it's me, Sam. Here's the deal. You tell me where the two keys are, the anywhere key and the black room key, and I will not kill all of your family. But I've got Kinsey right here. You better believe that I will kill her. Because he goes up and gets Ty from the main room and tells them that, uh, you know, I'm going to kill them both. And she's the mom says, Bodie's talking to the lady, says, you know, lady from the well says, it's time, Bodie. Go get me those keys or everyone's going to die. Bodie runs off to go get the keys. She says, good, good. Chapter six opens with Sam saying, hey, I got a gun to his head right now. You tell me where the keys are. Or he dies. She goes, fine. I'll tell you where the keys are. She doesn't know where the keys are. She's lying. She says, I'll tell you where the keys are. It's up in my room. It's up in the, the, the bedside table. Or it's in, it's in the cupboard in my room. Ty, you know where that is, right? And earlier in the book, she had met, she had told Ty, hey, there's a gun in my bedside table if you ever need it. Only you and Kinsey know where it is. So she's trying to get Ty to bring him upstairs so he can get the gun. They go upstairs and Bodhi has turned into a ghost and Bodhi's looking for the keys. And he imagines really hard because he said, if you imagine anything... You think about something, you go to it. So he imagines the anywhere key super hard, and he's thinking, he's thinking, and it just keeps bringing him back to Kinsey. But Kinsey isn't the key. But maybe Kinsey has the key. The bracelet, he realizes. The bracelet is the key. The key inside the bracelet is actually the anywhere key. So he turns back to his body, and he accidentally leaves the black room key in the door. He leaves it there. That's the door that he uses to turn into a ghost. And he runs off and he sneaks down to get the bracelet off of Kinsey. And mom's like, hey, Bodhi, is that you? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get help. I'm going to get help. He runs back and Sam and Ty are upstairs. Ty tries to get the gun. Sam sees this and says, oh, Ty, you idiot. The gun that I have isn't even loaded. But this gun that your mom had, that you just showed me where it is now because I saw you, that gun is loaded. So now I actually will shoot you. Ty runs away. Sam does catch up to him, unfortunately. But Ty was running to a certain black door. The black door that is left open because Bodhi left the key inside of it. Sam knocks Ty through it, kind of, which causes Ty's soul to leave his body. And his, his body now looks dead. And Sam thinks, oh, I've killed Ty. But Ty is floating around seeing this happen. Bodhi runs back to the woman says, here, here's the key. Here is the key. The anywhere key. It's yours. And she goes, thank you. You know, and this whole time she said, I keep my promises. I keep my promises. I keep my promises. I keep my promises. I'll stop Sam. I'll stop Sam. I'll stop Sam. But then she takes the key. She puts it in like a closet in the well house and she leaves. And Bodhi's like, wait, you said? And she's gone. She then pulls a different key out of a bag around her neck. And this key is, uh, it's got the face of a man and a woman. And it's got the symbols for man and woman intertwined on it. She uses this. She opens up a key in Kinsey's room and goes through this door. Earlier in the book, on a throwaway line, she's describing all the different keys. Like, yeah, one can take you anywhere. One can make you dead. One can change your gender. Or your, your, I'm sorry, change your sex. Like, it's a whole thing. So she uses this key. And she goes through this door, and she becomes a man. And this man looks just like Lucas Caravaggio. Lucas Caravaggio. <gasps> That's strange. He changes into some new clothes, and we see that Ty is floating around going, Wait, am I dead? I am dead. And he thinks about his mom and how sad she's going to be. He cuts, he his body, or his spirit, floats down to the basement and sees the mom. When he's down there as a ghost, he sees Sam going, I killed Ty, and I'm going to kill Kinsey. You lied about the keys. So here we go. And he's like, oh my god, I'm a ghost. But then he remembers, Bodhi was talking about this. And he talked about how you can go back into your body. So he does this. And he goes back through the door. And goes back into his body. And this is as Sam is about to kill Kinsey. And he attacks Sam. And they fight, and they fight, and they fight. And Sam drops his gun. And Kinsey picks up and shoots Sam. until he run- So he runs away. He's been shot in the neck. He's dying. Sam is going to die. And he sees Lucas, the man from the well, who was the woman from the well. And Lucas says, oh, hey, you did so good, Sam. You did so good. And I did promise you that things would be better. You're going to be so much more powerful. And he throws Sam's body through the black door. 
so that the his spirit leaves. So Sam's spirit leaves his body. Lucas then closes the door, locks it, so that he can't go back into his body. So he, Sam is just dead, and he's got his spirit floating around. And then Lucas uses the everywhere key, anywhere key, opens the door, and leaves. And he is gone. Where did Lucas go? Well, I'll tell you where Lucas went. Lucas went right to the coach's house. The coach who was being looked at by Lucas in a book. And Lucas says, hello, it's me, Ellie. I'm so happy to see you again. Do you mind if I come in? I mean, I did kill your mother for you, so really it's the least that you can do. Which is like, what? That's a huge plot point to just drop that I'm sure will be picked up in one of the other seven books. Oh, I'm sure you get the whole play-by-play. I can't wait to read it. I'm going to buy it. It's all on Kindle for like 60 bucks. I'm going to buy it all. The cops come and they're like, hey, this is what we understand. Sam came in. Sam was shot. He crawled his way out to this, through this door outside. We don't understand why. That's very strange, but everyone seems to be okay. And Tyler and his mom kind of reconcile. Tyler seems to have like a new lease on life as far as now at least. But we see just out of like a, a half panel, we see Sam's ghost. So Sam's ghost is going to be there forever because the door can open and close, but the magic is no longer Without active. the key, yeah. Two weeks later in Lovecraft, we see that Kinsey has put some dye in her hair. She's healing up. She's like, you know, Bodie, you don't turn into a ghost anymore. He's like, yeah, I don't know what happened to the key. And he's fishing again. And we see that reflection in the water. And we see Ty walk up. And he goes, oh, hey, how's the fishing? He goes, oh, it's not for catching fish. It's for... And his reflection, though, is actually him now. Which is so important. So he has mentally... He is healing. At least he is healing. gotten over, yeah, healed to a degree at this point, which is nice. Things are improving for poor, poor Ty. And Ty's like, hey, uh, this is Zach. He's new at school, just like all of us. And Zach's like, oh, yeah, I missed orientation week. And Zach is Lucas. It's the bad guy. How do you do, fellow kids? Right? And he's like, oh, yeah, hey, so you're Kinsey, right? I'm staying with your coach. She says you're incredibly tough. That's cool. And he goes, oh, Bodie, your brother tells me a lot about you. And Bodie's like, I don't like you. Bodie's like su- super uncomfortable because he, he knows who this is. Even if he doesn't know it, he knows it deep down. And the three older kids are like, hey, so we're going to go to the beach. You guys want to walk? And they're like, yeah, yeah, sounds good. Bodie, you coming? He's like, yeah, just a minute. And Bodie has pulled something up with his uh, super amazing finder technology. And it's another key. And this key has a face on it, a head on it. And it's a, it's like a bi- dissected brain or a – what's that called when you cut it down the middle and you can see the inside? Bisect. Bisect. Or, um, no, yeah, I know what you mean. A cross section. Yes. And it's exactly. got all like the – it's got the brain. It's got a bunch of different compartments and stuff like that. Very strange. What do you think this key does? So this one is the one that I think is in the trailer for the Netflix show. I think this like unlocks parts of your brain. Okay. That's my guess. I have no basis on that. The only thing I don't know about, there's like an infinity loop on the stem of the key. And I don't know that that like fits in super well with that. Yeah. Unless it gives. Yeah, that's true. Unless it's like a key of like infinite potential. Like, I don't know. I don't know what it does. I don't know either. But the last panel of this book is. Uh, to be continued in lock and key head games. And we see a bunch of keys and we don't know what any of these keys do, but some of them are one of which just is like a Riddler key with a question mark. And you're like, Oh, okay. So no one knows that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who's to say? There's a bunch of really cool looking keys, but I like that. This sets up like a really cool universe to come. And I'm very excited, but that's the book, John. What a weird book. Yeah. What a weird book. I, I loved it. I absolutely understand you just weren't in the headspace you said. Makes ter- you have to be in the right headspace for this. This is this is horror. This is a horror book. And I was ready for this. Uh it is Spook Vampire, but I I loved it a lot. Um do you think that if you were in a different headspace you may have enjoyed the book more? Or do you think this is is not your scene? I don't know how to really answer that question. Um I don't know. I think if I had some idea of what this book was, that might have also helped. But I and some of like the themes, like I just have had I had no clue what this was. And I'm like, oh it got like a Netflix series, like it's can't be that bad. That bad isn't like that gruesome or like whatever. Because there's like kids in the trailer. Like it it can't be that bad. It's that bad. <laughs> it is that bad. I, that don't mean that the quality was bad. I mean that like brutal. The themes were that heavy and that many of them. Yes. I agree with you and I, I understand your your hesitation. Uh, horror is not your thing as well. Correct. It's not. So this is, I don't think we'll be reading uh, volume two on this, this podcast. Uh, I would be more than willing to do a volume two with just me. Uh, Cause I really like this book, 
Maybe I'll just do it on YouTube or something, but, uh, you know, whatever. That Not every book has to be a, a John and Jeremy book, but this was a Jeremy book for sure. I very much enjoyed it. Hey, him. But we'll talk about what we're going to read next week, which is going to be lighter, or at the very least, less child murdery uh, in the outro. And that's the podcast this week, John. Uh, not necessarily a fun time for everything, but I enjoyed the heck out of it. I'm glad. <laughs> this is just not your cup of tea, and that's okay. Not everything has to be everybody's cup of tea. That's how I felt. I never uh, say it's a bad book. I just was not in the right space. That's how I feel about the first <laughs> Superior Spider-Man book, or Superior Octopus. The most recent yeah. Otto Octavia Spider-Man Superior book. Superior Spider-Man. I just wasn't, yeah. like, down with it. Nothing against it. It's a great great book. It's well-written. But I was like, I just, I'm not, it's not for me right now. That's, I, I, so I absolutely can understand how you feel with this one. But I enjoyed it, and I will absolutely be reading more of this. But, John, what are we reading next week? I know I'm excited. Next week, we're reading the brand new Eisner Award-winning Bitterroot Volume 2. Yes! Written by Chuck Brown and, uh, or created by Chuck Brown and David F. Walker. Art is by Sylvie Dodgson and Sanford Green. I'm so excited. I loved the first volume of this book. I cannot wait to read the next volume. Like you said, John. And the Eisner was for uh, best on, or best continuing series, best ongoing series. Yeah, for 2020. Like, it just won this award. This volume just dropped in October. I'm very excited. I'm very excited, too. I love this book. I love this book a it lot. It was, yeah, that was probably... One of, if not my favorite, like new discoveries for 2020, because Die was 2019. Yes. Yeah. So probably my favorite new discovery of 2020. Oh, this is uh. Yeah, this looks like it is going to be. It's going to continue after 10. So that's good. So there's more coming eventually. That's good because this is a good series, and I would like more of this series please and like the world has a lot of the world is very wide and there's a lot you can do in the world oh my god yeah you go forever with this but uh, very excited very very excited but john i wanted to talk to you about something that the reason we covered this book this week is not just for spook vember but it's also for i found actual keys that can unlock uh strange things in the in the real world john i found them I found a key as well. Did you really? I did. Well, let me, let me tell you about my keys since it was my book this okay. week. So I have this one key, and it allows you to to travel wherever you want as long as it's not across an ocean and as long as you fill it up with gas, fill the thing up with gas. But it travel wherever you want. It's like a car key. Okay. Well, okay. That's everyone's entitled to their opinion, John. But I got another key. This key allows me to uh, when I I put it in. You know, I, I turn it. It allows me to have security and safety and, you know, uh, to be warm or to be cool wherever I need it, to have a place to store my things and to sleep. That sounds like a key to a house or apartment or <sighs> hotel room, Some maybe? Some people like to believe in magic, John. Fine. Well, this one you can't argue with. This key is not a physical key. It's like a metaphysical key. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a concept more than anything. It's a series of, of symbols and runes. And this key can unlock things on uh, to, to open up things and to to utilize different things on the internet. It's so like a product. Yes, John, it's a product key for Microsoft Word. Why? You know what, John? Tell me about your key. Well, my key is magic. My key opens up a whole new world as long as you pay royalties to Walt Disney Company. That sounds like copyright infringement. Oh, it's the podcast this week. Follow us on Twitter at Talking Trades. Follow Jeremy on Twitter at Lizard King Twenty Seven. You can find John on Twitter at Maestro Laka M A E S T E R L A K A. And for this and other projects from Matt, please check out Facebook at Matt Spina Music. And remember, we're not experts; we're fans. 